So welcome everyone. This meeting is now being recorded. My name is Angela and I work for the town of Amherst. Um, this recording will get uploaded to our town of Amherst YouTube channel in the near future. And at this point, I will turn it over to the chair of the Jones Library Building Design Subcommittee, Christine Gray Mullen. Uh, hello to all. Um, I'm opening the design subcommittee meeting. Today is Thursday, January 19th at 4.30. And uh, this is sort of a dual meeting. So I will turn it over to the chair of the Jones Library Building Committee. Thank you, Christine. Um, so I want to convene the JLBC um, meeting. I'll ask you all to signify your presence vocally. Christine? Here. Thank you. Alex? Here. Sharon? Here. George? Here. Paul? Yes. Uh, Sean? Yeah. And Austin is uh, Austin is here. We are joined by uh, our good colleagues from FAA and from Colliers. And is there a quorum? Do we need to do anything about the equity subcommittee? I'm not seeing a quorum. Okay. So, let's hold on one second here. No, wait, I'm wrong. I see a quorum now of so they, the equity. So they need to convene their meeting? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, could Sharon, who would you like me to bring into the room? Yep. I got... I got the three. Okay. And now we would ask Farah Amin as the chair of the Equity, Justice and Inclusion Subcommittee uh, to call her committee to order. So that, hi. Hi, Farah. So that's all I have to say? You'll have to take attendance. Okay. Um, let's see, who do we have? Okay. Uh, Calling the equity just um, subcommittee to order. Um, just want to make sure that everyone here is pre can be heard. Um, Ginny Hamilton. Present. Walter Lloyd. Present. And Farah Amin, I'm present. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you all. Thanks to everybody for uh, attending. Uh, we're going to do this is a little different than we would normally do because we have two sets of minutes, I believe. Uh, so I'm going to ask first for a motion to approve the minutes of the uh, building committee from January 5th. Angie, were those minutes in the packet? I don't think they were. I don't see them. So we're not going to we're not going to do them because they're not in the packet. So the next item, Christine, is for you to to do as chair of the design subcommittee. I don't believe those minutes are in the packet either. Uh, there are mi minutes from 8.30 from the design subcommittee. I have not received them and I don't see them oh. in the um, on the town website in the packet. Okay. Well, we'll we'll leave it for the next time then. Sounds great. All right. Thank you so much, Christine. Sure. Next item uh, is a report from the town manager, Mr. Bockelman. Uh, nothing to report. Uh, very efficient. Okay. Finance update. Sean? Yeah. Thank you, Austin. Um, so been working with Craig to um, get a few consultants moving forward. Uh, we've given the okay for the uh, FF&E consultant to move forward, Stifera, right. uh working with FAA. And we just received proposals yesterday, um, a couple of days ago, for a commissioning consultant. Um, and so we're still processing those. Great. I think we did the, we did the budget 
review at the last meeting. So I, that, that's it for a finance update today. Unless Craig, you have anything you want to add? Nope. All right, terrific. Thank you very, thank you very much. Craig, to you. Thank you, Austin. Um, may I share my screen? You fine with me if you are? Is it is that enabled, Angie? Getting the uh, message uh, disabled. Participant screen sharing. Sharon, it's got to be you. There we go. Thank you. All right. So to start things off, take a. We'll give you a quick update on the schedule here. You zoom in so you can see it better. All right. So we are at present at this red line, which indicates we are um, solidly in design development. It's a, that's a four month exercise and we're two thirds of the way through the first month. Um, as discussed at the last meeting, the graphic uh, indicating the period of uh, impact um, of community input. We've extended that out and we're showing that now through the first half of design development. So that will um, continue through the end of February, approximately. Um, that's all for the schedule. Uh, are there any questions? I'll, I'll pause for a moment, see if there's any questions about the schedule. Right. Hearing none, I will move on. Let's see. So uh, to, today, uh, the design team has a number of items that they're gonna share with us uh, and ask for feedback. Um, the, but I wanna start off with uh, something that everyone I think is familiar with, but I just it's very important. So I wanna state it uh, again, that um, for this project, you know, one of the driving factors is gonna be the cost. Um, and so that being the case with each design option, you know, cost is always going to be in people's minds. It's always going to be a factor in the decision-making process. Um, so a number of the items that Feingold Alexander is going to present tonight, they're going to represent, or they're, they think, think that that represents, um, in their opinion, the um, option that gives the biggest benefit for the money. Um, so that's sort of a, an opening idea, opening thought. Um, the other thing I wanted to address is something that shows up on our agenda, but is not ready for ready today. Let's see, where is that? Um, so they're going to talk about real quick about the BE list, get clarification on a couple items, right. uh, talk about sustainability. The restrooms item is one that we're, we need to postpone until next week, uh, January 26th. Um, so what you know, this body had asked for a, uh, a study for a more open gender inclusive toilet room within the footprint of the previously approved layout. Um, so that's something that will be presented next week. So without further ado, I'd like to turn over the screen as well as the floor to find Gold Alexander to bring us through. Um, the items they prepared. And there are a couple that I have some input on. So what I'll do is I'll just pop my hand up when uh, I've, when I see we've come across those. Terrific. Thanks. Ellen. Hi, everybody. Thank you for um, joining us. Yes. Thanks for, <clears throat> thanks for inviting us. Uh, hopefully it's not snowing where you are. It's not snowing here yet. So as Craig did a great job introing what we're going to talk about and I'll, and Josephine's going to take us through the slides. Right. Um, so Josephine, I'll hand it over to you. And it, sure. during Josephine's presentation, let us know if you have any questions on the on the way through. Great, thanks. Thanks, Ellen and Craig. Um, I right now I can't share my screen. It says that it's still disabled <laughs> for me. It works now. Thank you.
So as Craig mentioned, I think we'll be passing the baton a little bit um, during this uh, presentation, but um, we have a few items that we want to check in on and um, get confirmation on before or as we proceed into DD. And so um, the first um, topic will be um, the sustainability goals that we touched base on a few years back and in several uh, meetings with you folks. Um, and so we'll just sort of quickly run through them um, and um, anyone can stop me at any time if, if you need to, um, but we're gonna start with the first goal, which was the EUI goal. And we had, if everybody recalls, we had a baseline EUI of 34 approximately. Um, and that was for the design as had been submitted to the MBLC. Um, and that is without any of the additional ECMs that had been requested to, to be um, studied from all of you. So with that said, we took those ECMs. Um, we had gotten approval to move forward with five ECMs, which are listed here. Um, with those additional ECMs, we were going to reduce the EUI to approximately 29. Those ECMs are listed here as lighting controls, HVAC occupancy controls, HVAC demand ventilation controls, lug load controls, and photovoltaics. These are the five ECMs that we assume that we're moving forward with to wrap up BDs. The one ECM we do want to touch base on, which I think Craig is probably going to chime in on, and I see his hand is raised there, <laughs> um, is the photovoltaics. We want to talk a little bit about, about that one. Um, so Craig, you can feel free to jump in on this and we'll- Absolutely. Thanks, Josephine. So, um, and we may have talked about this in the past, but I'll refresh everyone's memory. So there are a couple ways to obtain photovoltaic panels uh, for this project. Uh, one option is to is for the library to buy them outright, uh, include it in the documents that um, Feingold Alexander are putting together and have the contractor purchase them. Um, that does represent an upfront cost, which as we know uh, with our, our sort of budget challenges, um, that is not necessarily the best option. Uh, so you could buy them outright upfront cost and also a maintenance cost over time. That would be something you have to work into the operational budget. The other, another popular way to get them is um, the building will be constructed uh, to be PV ready, photovoltaic ready. And Feingold Alexander can talk a little bit more about those details. But the, the prime concept is that once construction is complete or towards the end of construction, the library can engage a, a photovoltaic leasing company. And that leasing company will, and this is sort of what you can do for your home as well. The leasing company will install and maintain the system um, after this project construction is done. Um, and the benefit, you know, the library benefits from that solar power, but without bearing the costs of installation and maintenance. Um, so given where we are, um, perhaps that latter option is, uh, is better. But um, if the library does want to own the system outright, um, then um, Jones, um, Feingold Alexander's cost estimator had had pegged that cost for the 10 kilowatt um, system between 45 and fifty thousand dollars. So that's something that could be added in. But as mentioned before, uh, we'll uh, need something sort of taken out to kind of balance it off. I see Let's Sean's just, got his hand up. Yep, yeah, Sean. Craig, we could still choose to own the system, but do it after the project's concluded if we wanted to, right? That is also another. I'm just wondering if there's a if, if there's a benefit from including it now, or should we just plan to do it all after? And like you said, make sure it's ready to go. Right. I think if the money were available, um, say in the DD cost estimate, you know, um, that is something that we could look into. But um, assuming that our uh, tight budget is going to continue. Um, yeah, either funding afterwards with other monies or or doing one of these lease options uh, may be the, the project's best path forward. Sharon? Yeah, I want to know if, so we, we've we signed a memorandum of understanding with Mass Save, depending on um, what our EUI will be, uh, not only once it's built, but a year afterwards, and, and then we get rebates. And I I don't know, 
I'm hoping Colliers can help. Will those rebates pay for its pay pay this fifty thousand um, dollars? I don't want to not have the panels, whether we own or lease, if it's going to negate that opportunity. Uh, very good point. Um, so the what what the town or library has signed with um, Eversource uh, or MassSafe is not binding. Um, so that is, was just sort of an early estimate, and then they'll, that'll be sort of confirmed later on down the line. And yes, you're right. Um, the money won't become available until the very end of the project once the library has demonstrated that it has taken action on all the things that it it promised and, uh, and an audit is performed. Um, in either, um, if I recall correctly, and um, maybe Josephine, you can you can back me up. I think the the EUI delta between having the on-site power generation and not was somewhat small. So that 10 kilowatt system um, is only providing, um, I think, 1% of your peak energy use. Right. Um, and so it's, I guess we'd have to look into what the, the difference in EUI is and what the different, um, what difference that would make in, our, in the rebate. Um, or incentive and, and sort of make make a, a value decision. Christine? Yeah, it's just building on that. So um, I see the 29.1. And what is the number that we really want to be above? And what kind of commitment do we have to have with the solar to make sure we're not missing something? Um. So I don't have that on my fingertips. Um, my recollection of, I'm looking back to my notes from the Eversource meeting. Want me to see here. chime in? Um, yes, Alex go ahead, Josephine. Gonna, hold on one sec. I want to get Alex in, please. Alex? That's okay, because I think Josephine might be saying it, and, and the Eversource meeting is perhaps different than the information that I have, which is the chart that you guys put together. So the, so the photovoltaics reduced it by 0.64. That was um, the estimate, at least, but I don't know what changed in the meetings with Eversource, so if there's more current information. Thank you. Uh, Josephine? Um, and that is correct. We had a 0.64, and that was for the um, amount of panels that we were showing at that, um, at that moment with um, the array that we had. Um, developed, which was, I think, 10 kilowatt. Um, it, I think the original goal, um, someone had asked about the EUI, and I think you guys were between 25 and 30. So um, we landed at 29 with these ECMs. And I want to say that the mass save, there was a tier one and a tier two, and, and um, was 30 the goal? In other words, we, we meet it at 29.1. Craig? Uh, yeah, so I was looking back at my notes, and it matches what Sharon was just saying. So that if you're if you have an EUI lower than thirty, then the construction incentive is two dollars a square foot. So keep so it looks like keeping the EUI below thirty, the, the eventual final EUI um, is uh, a, a good target. Uh, Alex. Yeah, I just want to um, echo something that Todd Holland um, on our sustainability committee has said a couple of times um, that, you know, our EUI goals are, are, are good, but um, actual usage of electricity in the building. And so if our target is 30, you know, and we're at 29, the solar panels have a small impact, but at the end of the day, you know, meeting that goal of 2930 is going to come down to actual use in the building. So I don't, again, I don't know enough to know that whether this 0.64 having it solar ready as opposed to putting the panels on is going to make that big a difference as much as how we actually use things once we get in the building. So, and I, I note that Todd uh, Holland and Sarah Draper are both in the audience. So if at some point you want their actual expertise, <laughs> Just letting you know they're out there. <laughs> All right. So, um, Josephine and 
Ellen, uh, it would be very helpful if you would remind us by framing what it is that we're actually now trying to accomplish with this. So you are presenting this for what purpose? Ellen, feel free to jump in, but to confirm that go. this is what we are moving forward with for DD. Okay, so this is a, a confirmation. This is what the plan is. You want us to say, yes, go ahead with this. Is that correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think um, it would be very helpful to go through this and then to see if Todd or Sarah, whoever else is here, could actually uh, comment on this. That would, I think, be very helpful. So why don't you go through the rest of this on the sustainability goals? So um, moving on to um, the next one, which was on-site renewables, um, that sort of brings us back to um, the PV panels. Um, we are currently assuming that we would be moving forward um, with that. Um, I think the off-site renewables was sort of tabled, but um, that's something we can we can discuss too towards the end of this. Um, the elimination of fossil fuels was next, but I think that was an easy one because we mm -hmm. decided we're all electric. And so um, that one seemed to be a pretty easy one across the board um, during our meetings previously. Um, next would be low embodied carbon materials. And, um, and this one is going to require a little bit more discussion because this introduces the CLT into the design. Um, one other item that we'll be um, pursuing through DD is looking, you know, starting to look at materials um, that also um, have low embodied carbon. So it'll be an ongoing um, discussion, but or um, an on ongoing research for us. But tonight we want to um, get into the CLT discussion a little bit further, which we will in a minute. Um, going to the next page. Um, the last sustainability goal was the um, whole building life cycle assessment. And um, this will be updated. Um, we don't um, have the exact date of when we will be doing that, but it will be run again during DD. And that's with um, the tally software that we have um, to, to look at the whole building design again um, and the materials. Um, so going Let's... back to the CLT if or yeah. do you want to talk about the goals? Nope. So we'll go, go back to this, go back to the CLT. Okay. So and, and Josephine, we should just yeah. remind folks that the CLT where we ended up the last time we talked about this in detail was that it, it's a hybrid system because of the nature of the building. That's correct. And um, and so hybrid can mean a lot of things. Yes. And so um, what we wanted to do tonight was sort of clarify what we're looking at currently, what our structural engineer is actually looking at right now. Um, things could shift a little bit, but the general um, feel of, of where CLT will be introduced in the addition is something we wanted to run by everyone tonight. Um, to sort of make sure that everybody's on the same page when we say hybrid and what that actually means. So we have a set of plans to sort of run through and, and we sort of color coded it um, to um, introduce, um, you know, different um, color for steel and different color for wood. So everybody can sort of get a feel of, of how um, things are going to start to lay out in um, the addition. So, what we've done here is um, color code um, the steel in blue and the CLT in a reddish, orangish tone. And um, this is not to scale. So don't be afraid when you see very large columns um, introduced here, <laughs> but we are showing um, the blue as the columns, beams, and slab. So what this means basically is that we have at the garden level, which we're in right now, um, it, when you look up, you would see um, steel beams and steel structure, steel and concrete. Um, the columns would be steel at this level. So everything at the ground level would be a steel and concrete system. And Josephine, with the design, we will probably end up covering a fair amount of that with 
ceilings and that kind of thing. But I, I think the, the general gist is that this whole level is a traditional steel in concrete. Moving up to the next level. This would be level one that you're standing at. So the first floor um, at grade. And you're seeing a mix here of steel and wood. And so you're seeing the slab highlighted in that red orange tone. And that's because if you were looking up at level one, um, you would be seeing the CLT. Because from here out, from here on up, the horizontal structure will be CLT. So you would see wood at the ceiling and a lot of the beams are gonna be wood as well. And same with the columns, the red squares that you see would be glue lands. So the introduction of steel here is um, for a couple of reasons, but um, the building um, needs lateral support. So the easiest way and the most cost-effective way is really doing it with steel. And this is why they are introducing um, this amount of steel and the locations of where you're seeing them. Again, they are still really looking, this is big picture, they're still designing, um, but this is where they're at the moment introducing steel at this first floor level. Uh, Josephine, I see that Sean might have a question, Sean. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Asa. Um, Josephine, you don't have to do it now, obviously, but maybe later. Could you show us a picture of what a combination of steel and CLT looks like, um, sort of in practice, uh, what it would look like? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, we do have some images. At the okay, end. thank you. So, perfect. Um, and yeah, just to keep in mind, too, is that um, even though we do have steel columns here, we could wrap them in wood right. to, you know, emphasize the feel that um, that there is CLT, you know, surrounding the space. We don't necessarily have to um, expose the steel. Um, we can um, hide it if you don't want that look. It's, but it's um, structurally, this is how it's being um, introduced right now into the structure. So going up to the second floor, but do you want to talk about the back wing, Josephine? Oh, sure. Yep. So let's go back. Sorry, it's a little slow. Um, so the back wing, they're introducing more steel for, um, again, moment connections and um, not introducing a variation of um, what could be a more complicated system if it was all CLT. So they are introducing more steel in this back addition here. So they're keeping the horizontal as CLT, but introducing steel columns and beams. Again, also because of the lateral movement as well. Could you just say, I'm sorry, Ellen, that, that may mean a lot to people. It doesn't to me exactly. By lateral movement, could you just tell me what you mean? So it means really movement side to side, right? Is because at some point there's a prediction we're gonna have a earthquake and all of our buildings have to come up to a certain level of an earthquake code. And uh -huh. that's what we mean by lateral movement. Okay. Um, and this, the addition is essentially independent of the existing building. Um, so it, it has to withstand that on its own. I see, okay, thank you. And then, and so to add to that, these um, lateral systems are, um, we're not structural engineers, but um, th they're, they have to remain in structural steel um, to, to keep that, um, that connection, you know, it's like That's what they stability. call a moment connection. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so um, if they, if they don't, then it can become, their, the structural system can become quite complex. Um, and of course, more costly. So, in, as Craig said that earlier on, this is the this is the hybrid, and it's the most economical, um, but buildable, right? That we we're getting a we'll, we're getting CLT, and I, I think one of the main things we were thinking about is we're getting CLT in in a very public 
uh, area. If you could point to that, Josephine, as you come in and pass the um, the CERC desk, that that's big and open and it's all CLT. Um, so that's where we are with this. And as Josephine said, it, we're still looking at this, but we but the when we say hybrid, that means so many things to so many different people. That's why we're going through this. It may yeah. feel a little tedious, but I think we want you folks to be understand what we're doing and why. So um, moving up to the second floor, it's um, somewhat similar. Um, again, a mix of wood and steel, a little bit more wood at this level. Um, but again, you know, they've got some um, steel coming across here for, again, that lateral component. But they're able to introduce a little bit more wood in this level. And the same holds true with the back here is that they're keeping the steel the, the beams and columns as steel. So we can go on to some images. Uh, Sharon, I see you have a question. I just a question about that back. Uh, you said that, so it's steel. Um, I understand on the first floor why it's got to be the steel, um, but can this not be the wood? Not at this, not in this design. We, okay. we would have to go back and recalculate everything. But one thing we should show you, just when David sent it in our Teams chat, a really nice image of steel with CLT. Um, can you bring that up? Um, I can. Give me one second. There's two websites, I think. It's the first one. And keep in mind, the other part of this, not to complicate things, is all of our, when we have CLT, we're going to be exposing, be, to expose the CLT. The conduits for electrical, we're going to be exposing ductwork. We're going to be exposing um, sprinkler lines. Our, can, can you see that on my page now? Yes, Josephine. Okay. Maybe you want to zoom in a little bit. So this was one link. I think. This and there's an the there's one. another one too. This one. Yeah, this is I thought was a good one. Um, that shows how how the main frame of this structure is steel, um, and then we have the combo with CLT. But you know what, Sharon, to you, I'm sorry, Austin, but to, uh, we, oh, we can we can ask again. We are told this is this is the best we have at the moment. And if we do, I don't even know if we have an option to change it without kicking up uh, this cost substantially, but we can ask that. Uh, no, don't, you know, you've answered my question. Good enough. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Alex, let me ask a question before, uh, if, if, you, if I may. So. Ellen, I had this na naive impression that this whole building was going to be CLT. Correct. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm just trying to understand this, the, the kind of evolution. Maybe I was wrong to have that imagining, but that was my imagining. Is, is the evolution to this hybrid design uh, driven by some code requirements? Uh, you have to have steel here and you... Uh, is it driven by cost? Is it driven by design? I mean, uh, kind of why are we why are we here as opposed to my imagining of it CLT everywhere? And Josephine, you can chime in, but I, I will say it's not it's not design in the perfect world. Um, Austin, we would have it all wood if we okay. could, right? Yeah. So it's partly it's the code requirement from in terms of the, as I mentioned, the lateral load, that yeah, is a code yeah. requirement. Okay. Um, how it, and, and that's why we're bringing this up and it, you're reinforcing the facts. Good thing we did bring it up now because we didn't want everybody to be yeah. surprised when they walk <laughs> in the library. Um, and Josephine, do you recall the, 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 and it was spent a little while, the progression on this? Um, well, 
I think the the main thing is the structural calculations and looking at the whole, right. you know, the building as a whole and, you know, seismic and, and, you know, now that the structural engineer is looking in depth, I mean, of course it can always be done, but it's more, I think, cost associated than it is even code. Um, <clears throat> Code, of course, is required because of, you know, lateral loads, um, but I think they can meet them, but I think some, sometimes it can get quite complex. So I don't know to what extent, I mean, we can check in with, with RSE and try to get a better understanding of how complex it would be. Um, but my understanding mm -hmm. is that it was, it, it was a cost from a cost standpoint. And the cost factor it would be? The, if it was all, my understanding is Austin, if it's all wood to wood connections yeah. where we need these lateral connections, yeah. it gets quite complicated and inexpensive. It's just not connecting the two. It's more gusset plates and, and that kind of thing. But I, I think we can follow, we absolutely will follow up with, with Jennifer again um, from our, our structural engineer. Okay, um, Alex? Yeah, you, you perhaps are already going to do this, Austin, but um, I, my guess is that um, Todd and Sarah probably have some questions that we might all benefit from. So I didn't Sure. Know. Uh, my, my hope was just to get uh, the, this whole presentation done and then, then to bring them in, if that's okay. Yeah, fine by me. I just didn't know if they had specific questions here, and so you wanted them here, or you just want them all at the end. Either way. Uh, my, my hope was just to show the whole thing and then to bring them in, and they can ask questions on any part of it, if that's, if that's all right. Works for me. Yep, Josephine, Ellen. Okay, so yeah, these were just some more images, um, but that web page actually was quite indicative of, of you know what you would be seeing with a steel and, and CLT um, structure. Um, so that will um, okay. sort of close out the sustainability goals, and then we have some value engineering items. Okay, just so let's confirm. let's let's. See if um, uh, is Sarah or Todd there, and if they want to be brought in, that would be terrific. Todd is in. Sarah want to be brought in. Todd, do you have any questions or comments on any of this, or Sarah? Sure. If uh, Sarah is not in yet, I can go. Yes, please. Thank you. My question was on um, the um, hybrid, the pictures of the steel frame and the CLT, um, when the building's actually finished, um, I'm used to seeing a spray applied fireproofing on the steel. Is that something like that would, would be the final look of that once the building is, is done? I'd have to check the code. I don't think the steel needs to be rated on this building, but yeah, I don't think so either. We'll we'll just double check. I don't have that. We did the code so long ago. I don't think we will. Um, but if it was, if it was with fire, if we needed fireproofing, we have the option to cover it. Right. Yeah. And that's probably what we would do just to keep it protected from being knocked off. It, it looks. The, the the black steel looks nice in those pictures, but it's a little different when it's that gray cellulose buzz. Yeah, agreed. Um, I think my main question is just, do we know yet what impact this hybrid version versus a fully wood version is going to have on the full, the full embodied carbon footprint of the building? I mean, that's, if I'm going to be boring, that's all I care about. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, we don't have, we wouldn't know that until we ran the Run report, yeah. right? And that report wouldn't happen until, that that update wouldn't happen until the end of DD? I think um, we'd have to look at when we could run, the best time to run it. Um, yeah. You know, all of the elements have to just be in place in the model um, for us to run it. So it wouldn't have to be the end, um, but we want to make sure that a lot of it's in there before we, um, before we actually do it. So that way we get something that's pretty, um, you know, pretty close to accurate moving forward. Mm. That's really challenging because it's sort of like we won't know the impact of the decision until you make we make the decision. And I don't know how to operate in that space, but maybe I don't have to. 
Well, it 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 may be it may be that we have to we have to see if we can do it earlier. But the 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 question is is you know if 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 the committee said you guys are are your mission is to make it all wood, um, I can't that will impact the cost absolutely. Um, I can't tell you how much. So if, if we if we can do a little side study with Craig and his team uh, to figure that out. Um, but we do know, Josephine, do you mind bringing the plan back up? This was helpful. Yeah. And David, thank you for sending that uh, to us. The, the plan, one thing, and, it, and this is probably off the table with you guys, if you go, yeah. So that back wing, if we went to all steel and metal deck and concrete, there'd be a decent savings. So there may be, and I don't can't don't quote me on this. Um, it, there may be a trade off that if we could get more steel back in the back wing, we may have more flexibility in the front. Um, but we we this that would be a separate little study that that we could do. Um, but what we have, and I think Craig, Craig mentioned it, it's the most cost-effective approach as we stand here today. Um, unless we can, you know, get figure out other ways to reduce cost. Are there? So I know that one of the like having the low carbon materials, you know, some of that is yet to be explored. Like some of those material choices that might happen later in design. Mm -hmm. um, how much do you feel is still on the table for like down the road decisions that may still help save carbon? Because I, from my experience, the structural piece is the biggest piece, but yeah. every project is different. Mm -hmm. Well, Josephine, that's a, that, you know, the, what we're what we're so design development we're picking finishes we're picking exterior materials um, we're picking mechanical systems so those we we we've settled on mechanical because we're all electric which is um, uh, where we are I I don't I I can't answer that without thinking about it in, in more detail I don't know if you can chime in Josephine no I think it's tough I agree. Um you know, we can definitely shoot for, um, you know, as many materials as we can to, mm -hmm. to you know, reduce that number, um, but without having those settled and running the report, it would be so hard to, to have an idea of, like, how much we would be saving or, you know, right. how much we would actually need to, you know, go back to, you know, a, a number that we were at previously, um, assuming that we were, we we would be at a little bit higher of a number. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really tough right now to... And Josephine, running the tally is not, it's involved. It's not a quick... It is, and that's why I, I, I'd want it, all, the, all the big ticket items yeah. to sort of be in the model before we did that, because I, I think it's, it's a, somewhat of a big production um, and it takes a bit of time. So we just want the model to be um, as up to date as possible. To get something you know pretty accurate so again i want to come back to i think the question sarah raised because i'm i'm a little i'm a little conf confused so you are asking us to sign off on this without um you or us knowing what the quote cost is to embody to the effort to reduce embodied carbon Josie, Josephine, well, let me just ask the question to Josephine. Yeah. Josephine, without digging up the tally uh, model, where did that, what did that include? I don't recall. We would have to um, dig that up. It, it was, um, it, I don't, I can't say what percentage was covered for a CLT. Um, right. in the space, um, we'd have to look and see how much of it was CLT because we always had hybrid, as we mentioned. We just right. don't know what the percentages were. So we would have to dig, dig that up to compare. Right, and, and we do have that data, but we don't, it's not at our fingertips, but yep. it we did, so the model was set on a hybrid system. So mm -hmm. we it was never calculated as wood everywhere because okay. we couldn't do it. 
yeah. based on the structure at that point. But yeah. is the is the model calculated on this distribution of steel and wood? We would have what just means we'll have to double check Austin. We okay. ran that model like yeah. four years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's totally that is totally fine. Yeah. And and then the question, uh, and I see Chris Riddle is there, and I'll just one one more thing before calling on Chris. And then this question of cost, and it's uh, I understand that this is more cost effective, but I wonder is there any way to translate that into you know an order of magnitude? I mean, yeah. it's that's what I had I I mentioned that maybe not clearly, Austin is we can yeah. talk to work with Craig make a couple of calls to our uh, okay, structural great. folks and, and see what we can come up with for great. sure. Okay, thank you so much. So Chris Riddle, if he could be uh, brought in. Chris? You hear me? There you go, yes, thank you. Good, thank you. I simply want to call everybody's attention to the fact that there exists two um, uh, buildings that are 100% uh, CLT in town, uh, mm -hmm. the, the Hitchcock Center and the Kern Center. And it's not like the Hampshire College or the Hitchcock Center are very wealthy clients. There, there it was a tight budget for both of those projects. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'd very much like to see the number for uh, something that's entire, entirely CLT. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Chris. Ellen, Josephine. Do you want us to respond to that? Well, your, the rising intonation of your voice suggests that you, <laughs> you would not like to, but. No, I will. I'm happy. Okay. I didn't want to jump in where I wasn't supposed to, Austin. No, so no. The, yeah, if you, um, if, we, yeah, we're happy. You know what? As I said, well, we can work with Craig. Craig, ch chime in. I mean, that, we could work and in, in, in do what folks are asking. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And is so, that a, oh, go ahead, Craig. Yes, and so um, right now, or for the rest of the project, you guys have two cost estimators, one that the design team's hired, one that the mm -hmm. town has hired directly. So not, as far as I know, neither of them are contracted for this study. So we can, so the first step would be like, hey, fellas, um, you know, to do this study, give us a, a quick proposal. I'm sure it won't be a lot of money, but it, it's something that we'll have to mm -hmm. ask them to get a proposal and, and go through it. I, I think, you know, uh, it's it's an unequivocal fact that an all timber yep. um, building is going to be more expensive than an all steel building, and then a hybrid is kind of in between them. Um, so we know that going to all mass timber is going to be more expensive, and, and you know, given the uh, the budget challenges we have, um, this it may prove to be a study that uh, is academic only, but doesn't you know in the end doesn't really change anything. Right, and I won't ask the same question again. More costly by an order of what? That's the, just that's the question. That's the question that yeah. once, once without knowing that thing, yeah, it's it's a little it's just a little hard. We take it. Uh, I, I take it that you you don't have those information at hand. So I see Christine, and then and then well, Sarah, Christine. Yeah, Josephine, if you could just sort of um, explain a little bit, because I think we have a lot of different ceilings going on here, like we're mostly focused on this area right now, but how would the transitioning go from, say, like the adult reading area, you know, what's on that ceiling, and then we have the ceiling with a lot of more wood, um, and then in the back steel with um, the CLT. So what, you know, would there be wood finishes at all? Like, can we afford that in, in some of these other ceilings or do we just go to the acoustical tile? Like what happens? So um, when, you, when you say other, do you mean in the existing wing? Yeah, existing exactly. Portion? Yeah. Right, so um, we can certainly talk about the finishes in these spaces, but um, we do, I do believe in Craig, Feel free to chime in, but the I think wood ceilings was VE'd out, so it was. yeah, right. so um, we wouldn't be looking at wood ceilings um, in these spaces. And, and I just, just think, you. can I just chime in? One of the oh, things, yeah. and this brings up um, the historicness 
of the existing. Christine, I, what we would typically do on an existing building, if possible, we would keep the existing ceilings as much as possible, right? And they're plaster. Um, in the, if we couldn't save the ceilings because we're doing too much work in there, we would go back with some with another gyp ceiling. So it would essentially look the same. So that's so what our design thought is the existing buildings, ceilings and walls will look as much like they do today and when we're done. Right. So we're saving as much of that historic fabric as absolutely possible. I don't know if that helps answer yeah, your that's great. So where there's plaster or you know, smooth what people mm -hmm. see that is what you try to put back right. in some areas where they just had too much conduit or too much you might have to like in offices i don't know if that stays plaster right. or acoustical ceiling yeah because we have to take into account the occupants right so in an in an office it may make better sense to put an acoustic ceiling in there you know just for noise so we do evaluate what kind of space the kind of noise so in we call it back of house being the office space would probably be acoustic tile if we had to replace the ceiling. Okay, so we have a lot of ceilings going on. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Austin, Wait, you're muted. Oh, awesome. I was having a perfectly great conversation with myself, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah. Okay. I couldn't tell if I lost my sound or you no, lost it was your me. Sound. It was me. Okay. Um, it's not another question. I just wanted to to make this statement again, um, because otherwise all of this conversation about embodied carbon and wood versus steel and concrete begins to sound really pedantic, but just like the reason that I'm harping and others might be harping is, you know, part of the original decision making a few years ago when we were brought on as sustainability committee was, is doing something like our big question was, is doing something better than doing nothing or is doing something better than some potential alternative. And a big driving factor in the yes behind that decision was we can do it without kind of blowing the carbon budget out of the water. So that that's why I'm being annoying about this. Um, and I'm not necessarily speaking to the, the design team here because I know you guys know that, but not everyone was like in those conversations however many years ago when we were talking about this. So I just wanted to put that to the room. Like that's why we're, we're worried about what these design decisions, what their impact will have on that embodied carbon because that was part of the go, no go. Right, but in the... Sarah, we the the at the end of that those conversations we had, it was a hybrid system. So it was the, those discussions um, was not all wood, um, but so the I think in in Austin you 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 had a good question. Of what we're asking you guys for, um, it's really it, it, this is for us informational. We're showing you okay. where we are, right? Okay. And I think uh, these are all good questions. And I think we, you know, our mission is just to go back and have a, a couple of conversations with our structural engineer and see what we can do if we can reduce the steel and where we can reduce it. Um, uh, and I guess I would be curious, and maybe Craig, you can yell at me if you want, but do we, would we ever consider doing the rear wing all in steel and, and metal deck and getting more wood in the main section if that's an all if that's an option craig do you want to speak some words of wisdom uh, i do so i i th this is not in uh response to what ellen just said but something we were talking about three minutes ago and that was the order of magnitude for the cost so we have two yeah. point two data points uh, the first one is sort of industry-wide so um, a number of months, I was over the summer, I attended a, a training seminar for, it was actually geared for cost estimators. Um, so I kind of weaseled my way in there and what they, you know, it was hosted by Woodworks, which is an expert in the industry. Uh, they do engineering design support for wood structures. 
And uh, that was the question on everyone's mind. What is the cost difference? And they said, they were kind of cute about it. They're like, well, it depends on the details, this and that. So there's a lot of factors that go into it. But they said in general, um, co tra traditional concrete and steel construction versus uh, glue lamb and CLT uh, is $7 per square foot less expensive. So just plugging that into the size of our building, that's uh, over $300,000 difference. And that is for all steel and concrete versus all mass timber. Um, the other data point we have is uh, for this project and on our value engineering list, uh, the cost estimators looked at putting in um, steel frame and metal deck instead of the timber throughout the building. And that was a $450,000 difference in their opinion. Um, so, um, so yeah, so some, some big numbers we're talking. So right. can you repeat that, um, Craig? So if we went with all steel and metal deck and concrete, it would be a savings? Right, of 450,000, okay. which um, because that was uh, out of step with the you know, goals of the project, yes. you know, back at the end of schematic design, that mm -hmm. one, those were taken off the table and said, no, 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 we do want as much wood as we can get. Okay. So, Alex. I, I guess I just want to, I think the, the thing that I'm not 100% clear on is, so when we did the whole building life cycle analysis and we came up with the, you know, the carbon load, it was based on a hybrid. And I guess the piece that I'm missing is, again, how much this differs from where is where is the balance toward concrete versus CLT from where we, whatever we base the numbers on when we did the analysis? Like, do we have a sense of are we talking twenty percent more steel than we did? Are we talking, like, I, I guess that's part I don't understand. I think I, I Alex, I'd love to tell you this is exactly what we based it on, right? This is this is in the ballpark, but I don't want to say that and be incorrect. So if we will double check that, right? We and it, and we probably should have done it before this meeting. We weren't thinking that, but it, it's a good question, and and we we'll, we have to go back and check the tally, um, and we can do that in the next few days. Okay. So that also, I think, just to get the uh, could could someone take down the diagram for one sec? I think that to get the sequence. Right. Uh, what you were talking about before, Craig, with going back and somebody's going to have to do more work and it's going to cost us more money, that getting the answer to the question that Alex just raised uh, would be a preliminary to that. Mm -hmm. So if you come back and you say, well, we've had to add 40 percent more steel or something, that's different than if you come back and you say there's there's no difference between what we had and what it is now. Um, and I think that that getting clarity on that would be very helpful. And again, I'm going to say what I think many people might have understood, and I did as well, which is this is going to be cross-laminated timber. So the idea that it was a hybrid from the time that we were talking about it, um, I think we need as much clarity about that's what it was, and this doesn't change it, or this changes it by just a little. Before we go off and bid other things, I think finding that out would be a good thing to do. Okay, so any other questions now about the sustainability piece? And again, I appreciate it. I just want to restate, this is for informational purposes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if there are no other questions about the sustainability piece, then can we go to the value engineering piece and talk about bringing back the sawtooth roof? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Let me share my screen. <laughs> As I'm sure Craig cringes, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, we have three items on that value engineering list um, that we sort of pulled out of um, Craig's uh, lovely list that he had. Um, drawn up uh, last year. And so the 
you know, one of the big ones, of course, the CLT. The next one was yeah. um, the sawtooth roof. Yeah. Um, Josephine, can I just, uh, let me just jump in why we're yeah. asking this again, right? Yeah. Because I, we, we know what Austin's <laughs> going to say. We already talked about this. But what if we're at the point of no return yeah. in the drawings, if we, we're right now, there's no sawtooth. And we just want everybody to say that's correct or that's wrong. But I'll go ahead, Josephine. No, I think that's exactly where we are. Um, it, it's a complicated system, and there's been a little bit of back and forth since um, the disc the e discussions that we all had last year um, regarding the sawtooth roof. And so um, we want to make sure we're all in the same um, thinking, the same thing, and in the same place with where we're, we're going with that piece of the design. Alex. And Craig, I might be beating Craig to the punch. So um, we had proposed changing slate to synthetic slate. And at the time that we made the decision about the sawtooth roof, we didn't know the savings. And so the conversation was, once we know the savings, does it come back? We come back and consider, you know, a partial or limited. And I, I guess from my perspective, um, once I know the answer to the CLT question, that might inform the thought. Like if we have an extra sort of savings that we can use, should we be using it towards the CLT or should we be using it towards the sawtooth? And that's just put out there for the group to think about. Thank you, Alex. Craig? Thank you, Austin. Um, so with the roof, there are a number of uh, factors that are all sort of in play. Um, as we all remember, we, we removed the sawtooth feature in order to reduce the cost. Um, as Alex correctly just uh, recalled for us, uh, the, you know, moving from a real slate replacement roof to a synthetic slate replacement roof does save uh, somewhere in the order of uh, $300,000. So at the time we said, okay, well, maybe we you know, do go back to the sawtooth. Um, however, um, in, in talking with Feingold Alexander, we are. We know that the project is counting on the historic tax credit. Right. Um, we we don't. I don't think anyone can say for certain whether going to synthetic slate does not jeopardize that tax credit. So because we can't say for certain, we you know, so we, we. I think we all all understand that Amherst uh, historic, it, based on their precedents, uh, will be okay with the synthetic but that um tax credit perhaps is not we've been told is a very competitive thing and sort of the more you do the better um so we are concerned about counting on those savings if later we find out that to get your tax credit you know you, you needed <laughs> real slate roof so we were a little uneasy about plowing that money into sort of the um the new additions roof um, the other things that sort of um, factor in is uh, while we have taken out the sawtooth um, elements, we do still have a, a in the design and in the cost estimate a, a long um, skylight, sort of right down the spine of the addition. Um, MBLC has been uh, very vocal about their displeasure with skylights. Um, so the so another option um, is a a light monitor, which is sort of similar to a sawtooth light monitor, but um, different geometry, so that the glass is vertical. Um, so that's sort of a factor as well, like getting natural light in. So there's a benefit to getting natural light in. Perhaps instead of skylight, we're doing a light monitor. Um, the other thing that kind of weighs in, so now we're balancing all these factors, is um, we were talking about the photovoltaic roof uh, panels. Once we had the sawtooth uh, roof, there was not a whole lot of space, physical space for the uh, PV panels. Now that those are gone and we have a lot more flat roof, we actually open up the opportunity for instead of a uh, 10 kilowatt um, PV array, perhaps a larger PV array. So they're and they're all interconnected. It's a historic tax credit, um, you know, construction budget, 
um, getting natural daylight in, MBLCs, uh, aversion to skylights, and uh, availability of open flat roof or a PV array. So it's it, it's a multi-headed uh, decision. So I just wanted to <laughs> put all those complications out there so that we can start sorting through them. So again, I just want to make sure I understand. So this says confirm the approach. So this is, you want us not just to be informed, but you want us to say yes from, as you go into further design development work, you should be confident of these assumptions. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. So I'll just speak for myself as the, uh, as I recall, it was a pretty clear decision about not going forward with the sawtooth sore tooth roof and there was some as alex pointed out some possibility that we talked about maybe fewer of these sore tooth roof design but i at, at this point uh, unless someone tells me differently I, I i don't know why we would revisit it at this point but someone may feel strongly they want to revisit it i'm i I love them, but I lost. So I'm not saying that we should revisit them. Sharon. I feel like based on everything that Craig just said that we should not revisit yeah. it. Yeah. So does anybody on this one think that there's anything that we need to say about revisiting the saw tooth roof? I'm hoping that you'll that you'll distribute to each of us a little model based on the original design so I can keep the sawtooth roof on my desk. But for this purpose, I think we should go on to the next item. Great. Thank you, Austin. Um, so the next and last item was um, just what we are going to be doing with the existing windows and the original structure. Um, we it's highlighted in the VE list that Craig yep. had issued. Um, I don't think it was fully clear to us which direction to go in um, with those and whether we're replacing um, the windows or not. Craig. So the, the current cost estimates um, include replacing the windows. So uh, this committee did not opt to grab the savings, potential savings of keeping the existing windows. Sharon. Can you tell me, uh, so I'd love, I'm gonna put George on the spot. I'd love for George to talk about uh, the condition of our existing windows, cause they're not great. I sit next to them and I, I swear, yeah, it's not good. But how much, if we did cut it, what, if we left the windows alone, how much are we talking about saving? It, it was a hundred and seventy thousand. Um, but as a as a corollary to that, I, I question whether or not we can have a high performance building with an EUI sub thirty with existing windows. George and I and I think part of part of that conversation was what would it cost to restore the original windows right. to make them more efficient and. I think that's why we are taking it off the table to leave the original windows here. And uh, the, the answer to that was uh, repairing windows will, in, in the cost estimates experience, cost the same as replacing them when all is said and done. So again, I'm just going to pose it in the same way. Uh, if, if, is there any uh, inclination to revisit this um, decision to confirm uh, that we will be replacing the existing windows. Okay, uh, Paul. Are there any historic tax um, considerations for this? Craig? Uh, I, I think not because they'll be replaced with uh, something that looks historic and, and that is lots of precedent for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Okay, any other questions now about the window issue? Okay. That's it for us. So uh, great thanks to FAA um, for the work and for um, uh, the work that you will do and the work that you have done. Uh, we'll look forward to hearing back from you on this question about the steel versus wood.
um, issue. Craig, something else from you? Um, nope, that, that's all I've got. Uh, right, so there was something in this packet, proposal for interior design services, Craig? Uh, yes, actually, thank you for bringing that up. So that is um, that would be a uh, consultant to the design team. Um, there, there. Let's see. Uh, I think it was one hundred two thousand dollars. So um, uh, a very reasonable fee for the services they'll be providing. The first couple phases, something that was important to the to the town, uh, was limiting the exposure. Um, on cost. And so the first couple of phases, I think only total $17,000. Um, and so it's uh, a low commitment. Um, but then by the end of the project, you know, the, the full cost will be 102,000. But um, yeah, so that this is, it, it's, it's got my recommendation for, you know, approval. Um, uh, Paul and Sean have, we've talked about it with them. They are comfortable with it. Um, with the design team moving forward. And so the next step is the design team will take that proposal and, and put it into a, a request, uh, an additional services request, something that the town can review and, and sign to make it official. So does anybody have any questions about this uh, proposal for interior design services that was included in the packet? Craig, the one thing that wasn't clear to me, I'm sorry, maybe it, it, it is, is in the proposed fees, it says programming schematic design, $17,000. That gets us through um, uh, through October and then design development. How does that, uh, I just don't have your chart in front of me. How does that kind of sequence in with the whole design development? Uh, Great um, question. So uh, the uh, interior design, they have their own schematic design phase and their own design development phase. And so they, it lags behind the architectural um, schematic design and design development. So those are uh, activities that haven't started yet. So um, Ellen and Josephine can probably speak to it uh, with more accuracy than I can, but basically the schematic design for Stephora will be running in parallel with the design development and, and construction documentation by the, by the architects. From FAA. Yeah. Ellen, Josephine, did you want to say anything else about that in terms of the sequencing of the work? No, I think that's that okay. makes it clear. Okay. So, uh, Sean and Paul, do you need anything from the committee? Do you need an endorsement, a recommendation? So, um, if the committee wants to indicate approval for it now, when we do get that request for additional services, we can move forward with it. Um, or we can wait till we actually have it if the committee wants to see it first. So we could either ways, uh, probably better to wait till we actually have okay. it. Great. Great, thank, thank, thanks so much. All right, Craig, anything else? No, sir. Thank you as always. The next yeah. item is a report from the design subcommittee. Christine. Nothing to report. <laughs> thank you, Alex from Outreach. Uh, so, uh, as everybody knows, I think, um, the survey closed for the bathroom design. Um, we received, we actually got one more in, so 212 surveys, about 60 of them were, uh, handwritten surveys <coughs> um, and the rest were electronic. Um, I forwarded a link to everyone in the committee so you can review the results. Um, also a link that we can put publicly if we want. Again, I just, it's however people want to. People want to put it as part of the meeting, you know, whatever people want to do, it's available. Um, and then if people want to see the information in a different way, just let me know and I can try to formulate it differently. But it was, I, I think, I think 212 people was a pretty good showing. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so happy to have heard from the public. A lot, of, a lot of good feedback, actually, a lot of thoughtful feedback, which I was super appreciative. People really, really took it seriously and thought about what was important to them. So I, I appreciate everybody who uh, responded in the public. Yeah, I thought the results were very, very, very helpful. Uh, Ginny? Thanks, Austin. I'm, I'm not sure uh, if this is the right time uh, for this. I know that we're not at 
and with my equity subcommittee hat on, I know we're not talking today more in detail about the garden level bathrooms. However, at our um, recent uh, subcommittee meeting, we were talking about bathrooms as a whole in the building. And I wanted to at least raise that question, knowing that designs are moving quickly. Um, so when we were having that discussion um, and looking at the garden level primarily, um, uh, we brought up the idea of accessibility in the stalls and the room for people um, using, whether it be a mechanical wheelchair, having a, a, um, an assistant in there with them, um, so on and so forth. Um, and then as we started looking through the plans and other levels of the building, it was unclear whether the uh, single unit bathrooms on every floor were fully accessible in the current design. Um, so um, wanted to raise that because that would be the desire um, and but didn't know, I don't know how to read architectural design. So just wanted to bring it up um, as, as part of that conversation. Great. Greg, do you have anything you want to um, I do not know offhand, um, and and perhaps the design team um, can take a look at their drawings and by you know for the meeting next week, right. um, speak to that. But we have Josephine, we have that as a quick answer. Yes, all the other bathrooms are accessible. Absolutely. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate you confirming that. Okay, um, Alex. Again, anything else from outreach? Not this time. So I do want to just say a, a, a extraordinary and special word of thanks to Alex and the outreach committee. The survey thing is phenomenal. And um, Alex is uh, both a magician and a very, very attuned member of the community in terms of making sure that all voices get heard. So I really want to thank you for putting together this um, the survey. OK, I have no correspondence that I know of. Um, no topics not anticipated within 48 hours. Uh, we have, I think, I see 11 attendees. If any member of the public wishes to comment, if they would raise their virtual hand. Okay, I see no member of the public. Uh, wishing to to comment or speak, uh, I want to thank uh, the uh, eleven attendees for uh, for for attending. I want to thank you for all of your good work this afternoon, and uh, I think we can stand adjourned. Uh, online, I just want to make sure: do we need the adjournment of the design committee and then the equity subcommittee? Angie, yes. Okay, so. Let's do it in the following order. So equity subcommittee, how about you adjourn? Equity subcommittee uh, is adjourned. Thank and you, th Austin. Thanks to the equity subcommittee for joining this meeting. Christine, design subcommittee. We are adjourned. And the JLBC is adjourned. See you all soon. Stay well, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.